like a fast and volunteer. Yeah. You look like a fast and volunteer. Yeah, that's a bit. Espero que salga muy bien la charla. Sí, yo. Hola, Roberto. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo, ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estáis? ¿Estáis preparados? Should we go? Should we? Okay. So hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Roberto Di Cosmo, Stefano Zacchiroli. You probably know us for our long history in free software before, but we are here today extremely excited to tell you about a new project that is taking up basically all of our energy. It is called Software Heritage, and we are basically building the library of Alexandria or source code. But before going into the details, let me give you some motivation. So if we look around us, we see software everywhere. It powers the digital transformation, it fuels our innovation, it's an essential component of modern research, it's an essential mediator for accessing digital information in any shape, and you think about it, we use it everywhere, uh, everywhere from communication, entertainment, Politics, the way you are organizing politics, depends on software. So in some sense, software embeds, embodies a significant part of our knowledge and our cultural heritage. But as we know very well in our community, when you talk about software, there is one thing which is really the knowledge, and this thing is a source code. Uh, the source code of the software, which is a very special object in human history, if you think about it, it is human readable executable knowledge which is a first kind in, in human history a kind of an object like this one as harold abelson who was a, a, a he is a, a, a fantastic teacher he wrote a book i was using when i was, was young and university he is also by the way one of the founder of the software foundation of uh, creative commons he used to say that computer programs should be written in the first place for people to read and only accessorily for machines to execute. They should be, I mean, this is a recommendation for students, of course. And now if you look at the incredible amount of free software which is around, now you have access to pieces of code which are beautiful. For example, look at the source code of the Quake 2 game, which was released, the free software. Uh, Many years ago, uh, uh, well, it is not very readable here. I do suggest you go and, and read it over the internet. There are fantastic pieces of, of hackery on how to make this 3D animation work on machines which are not powerful enough. There are incredible tricks in the, in the uh, Linux kernel, for example. And to understand what is really going on, you need to go and read the source and read the comments that are in there. As Len Schuster, who is the founder of the Computer History Museum, says, having access to the source code of our software is actually an incredible open window in the mind of the designer. And if we think a little bit about this a little bit more, I mean, this is actually, I mean, our free software are really the software commons, our software commons. But what are the commons? Well, the commons are basically resources which are holding common that do not, are not owned by anybody in particular but that everybody can use freely. We are used to this in economy, air, water, something like this. If you think about software commons, I mean, this is the software that is held in common that everybody can reuse, adapt, and so basically everything which is free and open source software is a software commons. But unfortunately, if you think a little bit about it, you know that from economy, when you have something which is held in common, you often have what is called the tragedy of the commons. I mean, if you don't care about your commons, if you don't nurture the commons, if you don't cherish the commons, they will eventually deperish. 
We know this, that's the reason why as a community we are very active trying to maintain our software, make sure there is a community taking care of it, making it evolve, getting new people on board, sharing our principles and values, that's very nice. But if you <coughs> look at our source code, I mean, this is really a precious part of our knowledge. Are we really doing everything necessary to make sure it is maintained over time? Well, not really. There are a few issues uh, we need to face. One thing is that, of course, software is everywhere. That's positive. But software is also spread all around, and that's an issue, because we are actually using many, many different disparate platforms for developing software. We are strongly opinionated people, so I use mine, you use yours, everybody uses their own preferred development platforms. Here in this uh, uh, tag cloud, I have just highlighted some names that should ring a bell to all people like me that use the platform that more or less disappeared today. And other names that should ring a bell to modern people that use very modern platforms that are very useful and who knows where they will be in 10 years, okay? Uh, but so not only we have many development platforms, we also have many places where we distribute the resulting software. Somebody uses a development platform to distribute the software, somebody uses archives, many, many different things. And to make matters worse, over time, projects migrate. Uh, so you start it in one place, then you move it to another. If you do your homework well, you usually should close the old one and putting a readme saying the new one is there, but not everybody does it. I mean, and so it's not easy to follow the evolution of other software. software. In a world, what we are sorely missing is a single place where you can actually have a global vision of all the software which is available. What we miss is a place where you can really find, track, and search all the source code, no matter where and how it has been developed, no matter where and how it has been distributed. So that's issue number one. But then you have issue number two, which is our source code, which is software, is actually fragile. Maybe we don't notice, well, maybe a lot of people now notice after what happened four years ago, but I mean, we'll, we'll come to back to that a little bit later on. Uh, of course, you know, digital information is fragile. You can, you can have accidents, your server can break down, you can have an earthquake, you can have a fire. You can make mistakes. I mean, who never actually hit RM minus RF in the wrong directory? Uh, raise your hand if you didn't do it. Sure, sure, I know, uh, well, okay, these kind of things. This is well known. But then more recently, you see different kind of problems which are malicious attack. Somebody cracking into your system and just removing everything if you don't ship 150,000 euros in bitcoins to some specific account. So this is very fashionable lately. But more recently, we have discovered that there is an even greater danger, which is basically business decisions. Okay? In, in mid-2015, when Gitorios were bought out in a few weeks, more than 100,000 repositories had to find a new place. When Google Code was shut down, more or less in the, memo, in, in the same moment, over one million and a half repositories had to migrate elsewhere. Okay, so this is new. We were not used to this kind of situation. So what we are really, really missing today is an archive, a real archive that has a mission of preserving the content, written in its mission. It's a place where you can go if a repository goes away, a repository that was on GitHub or GitLab, or if the platform that you are using for doing development goes away or has failed backups. And the third question is, if you look at the software we are developing, now there is an incredible amount of software which is available for everybody to study, to understand, to look at, and we have many things to do, automatic analysis, bug analysis, trend analysis, the, um, uh, vulnerability detection or something like this. Well, our friends in physics know very well for this kind of big challenges, you need serious instruments to look into this kind of objects. But today, we should copy what people do in physics. I mean, build large telescope to look at the stars. Where is the large telescope to look at our source code and study it, understand how it evolves. 
So these are just three issues we face and we need to take action. So to take action now, we started with Stefano uh, quite, quite, quite a long time ago. I mean, it was undercover for a while. A project which is called Software Heritage that has the precise mission and it is carved in stone. Our mission is not to become rich, is not to become famous. Our mission is to collect, organize, preserve, and share all of the source co code which is publicly available. And we want to do it because it is important to preserve the old source code, of course, but it is even more important to have a single place where you can actually study and enhance the software we are building today to prepare for a better future later on. Okay. And now, how would you do something like this? I mean, that's a nice motivation. Let's see, let's see what these guys actually do. Okay. But first of all, you sit down and try to think about what the best way of organizing a project like this one. So one idea is to take a, a little bit of Unix philosophy, so let's do one thing and do one thing well. So what we want to build is really, really a common infrastructure, a common platform that only cares about the source code. And then on top of this, <laughs> we want to enable other people to develop a wealth of application that can be related to cultural heritage, to industry, to research, to education. Just, just to give a couple of examples, think about what you can do uh, if you have a universal reference catalog of all the software that has been built with all of the history of its development. Okay? The kind of analysis, the kind of study you can do. The other ways of building software that you can develop. For research, having a single place where research software can actually be put and reused by other people who care about reproducibility. For people doing research on software, having a single place where in a uniform way everything is available to perform your research in a repeatable way. And there are many, many other applications. We don't want to do it. We want to enable it. I mean, it's an infrastructure for doing all this. But that's not an easy task. How can you sustain such a project? How can you organize such a project? So we have two basic principles. First of all, of course, coming from the community, which is ours, it's evident we want to have everything as open source software. 100% of all the development of the infrastructure we are building is available as free and open source software. But also, we highly value transparency. We do not believe we are the strongest in the world and we take decision it will be the best one. We want to have other people coming and working with us to find the best way of making progress. And on the other side, we are really here for the long haul. I mean, it will take time to build such an infrastructure. It will take time to make it sustainable over time. And the only solution to make sure this project will last over time is to use basic principles of reliability engineering, which is basically replication. Okay? So replication at all levels. We should not just have a copy of our data ourselves. It should create a network of mirrors that make copies in other places, in other countries, under different legislation possibly using different technology to make sure if one node disappears, others will be there. But it also means replication in terms of uh, contribution. So not just having a single company or a startup running this. No, we want to build a non-profit, multi-stakeholder organization where many people with different reasons of being there contribute to make it viable. And you see, since we have people from cultural heritage which are interested in from industry and from research, from education, we do hope to bring around the table many people coming from different places for different reasons, and they should never go away altogether. I do not want to see again a single manager that says, hmm, what, what's this project I have here? Then let's, let's scratch it, okay? We, and then you have to move another million repository somewhere else. Uh, so all of this, is nice and fine, it is a high level vision of what you're doing. Now I think you are curious to know what we are doing technically inside, how far we went. And is this just uh, slideware and vaporware, or is this actually software and hardware running? And here I enter Stefano, who will give you a very nice view of what is going on. Thanks. So let's dive into the specifics of what we're doing and how we are doing it. So first of all, what we do actually archive 
and what is in the scope of our archival mission. So we go after places where we know we will find source code, and specifically publicly available source code. And so what we go after practically are publicly available version control system, as well as source code distribution artifacts, such as tarballs or uh, pa distribution source packages. And when we find those places, what we retrieve from those places are actual file content, also known as blobs. We call these content objects. We retrieve commits because we, care, we, inter we, we think that source code itself is very important, but the history of its development is important as well as knowledge that tells you why specific changes have been made in a specific piece of code. So we archive all commits that we find, that we call revisions, with all their metadata. So commit messages, auto information, information about which were the, the previous commits, so on and so forth. We archive releases, that is, specifically annotated commits that author are considered to be uh, worthwhile for a sof specific software release with a given name and a given version number. And we archive for all those information uh, where, the information about where we have found it, which we call software origins, and when we have found it. So for each object we add to our archive, we, 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 note, we note down, we have seen that in that specific repository or in that specific pack, uh, distribution package at that specific time. Uh, all this is stored in a um, canonical model, which I'll describe in a bit uh, in more detail, but is, which is independent of specific version control system technology or uh, packaging representation. So different VCS, different distribution packages, all stored in the same model. What we do not archive, for now at least, trying to focus on doing one thing for the moment, is we don't store on page, website or project, wikis, we don't store backtracking system information or issues or uh, the history of uh, code reviews, for instance, and we don't store mailing lists. So for now, it's to focus on a single mission, but in the medium long term, our idea is that we basically should play one role in a more general semantic Wikipedia of software, where the information we store will be, put in, will be linked to store information stored by other people, other archiving initiatives, by saying at the time that source code was archived, well, the, the website of, of the corresponding project looked like this. And the same you can imagine for issues, for bugs, and for code reviews, and, and so on and so forth. So this is what we actually archive. And uh, how does it work? So it's a pretty standard search engine-like uh, architecture implemented as a two-tier process. So on the left here, you have all the places where source code can be found. So you can imagine the major uh, centralized hosting platforms. You can imagine is specific instances of hosting platforms you can deploy yourself on premise. You can imagine distribution with their source code packages. And you can imagine, this, you can imagine the specific repository that exists behind um, language specific package manager, for instance. And all those conceptual places are processed by a component, components that we call listers. And what they do is they, they go after a specific forge and can do uh, either complete, full listing of all the repositories available there, or incremental listings, saying something like, what new repository have been created since the last time I've been there? And the result of those listers are stored in our database as points, which we call software origin. And each point is actually a single repository or a single package. So you can imagine here that for any repository on GitHub or on Bitbucket, we have created a data point with a canonical URL where we can retrieve code from. And we keep that in mind for future processing with the second tier of this process. This happened periodically. Okay, and we, what we develop in terms of code is a specific lister for every specific hosting place. So we will have a lister for GitHub, one for uh, Bitbucket, one for GitLab, and for GitLab, this lister will list different GitLab instances available out there. So this is step one. It is now a, uh, a pool model, so we periodically redo that, but in theory, it could also be pushed when we receive notification from partnership, uh, partnering hosting platforms about the new events. And the second step is periodic as well, and is actually loading. So we go after any specific software origin we have stored here, and we use a loader component to retrieve all the content that is available from that repository, for instance. So we retrieve all the commits, all the revisions, all the blobs. And what we do, we add that to our archive, deduplicating everything globally. So when we find a new commit in a specific repository, we check whether we have already archived that commit, for instance, from a different uh, repository, and we add it to the, uh, to the archive only if it, that's the first time that we have seen. Okay? So this model is the 
canonical model in which we store everything, where we, everything essentially is stored only once, massively du duplicated, and is implemented as a, uh, two different conceptual parts, a, a Merkle DAG and a blob storage. So for those of you that might not be familiar with the, what a Merkle structure is, is a, a data structure that might be a tree, a list, or a DAG, as in our case, which is essentially a hash of hashes. So each node in these structures has an identifier which is not chosen by you when you add stuff, but is intrinsic. So the identifier of a given node is computed by the content of the node itself and by the identifiers of the node that have been that are pointed by these specific nodes. It's a very specific, very common cryptographic construction that you find in a, a lot of technology these days. You find it at the basis of Git, you find it in blockchains, you find it in IPFS, it's very popular, and it has some very nice properties. For instance, it allows to compare to a huge structure very quickly if they, if they differ in only some specific places. Because, for instance, if the root uh, identifier of two huge graphs of two huge trees are the same, you know that the entire content of the trees are the same, assuming that it's the uh, um, data structure is consistent. And also, of course, it supports built-in deduplication. Because when you add something, it has a predefined identifier based on its content. And so if the node is already there, you just don't store an additional copy of it anymore. So we use this in the DAG variant, because in commit history, you might have uh, actually known tree uh, substructures. And an example of we, the kind of nodes we have in our archive, this is a revision node. It's a commit, which has been done actually on our own forge by uh, Nicola, which is one of our uh, fellow engineers. And all the information of the, the commits, so the, the tree, the directory that existed at the time when it was committed, the parent commit, the author, the committer, which might differ if you have someone else pushing the code that you've committed yourself, the commit message is used to compute the ID of the node. And that ID will be the ID we have in our archive for this specific node. So uh, in passing, I, uh, I know that our IDs for now are compatible with Git itself. It's not a long-term design decision, but given the popularity of Git, it's a good property to have today. So if you have uh, um, object IDs coming from, from Git, you can use them directly to check if something is present in our archive or not. Um, so that was a specific node. The conceptual structure of our archive as a whole is then a huge graph in which you have blobs here, so those are the individual content of files without their names, just the identified by the hash of their content. You have directories pointing to blobs. You have commit. These are the director, directory structures. Okay. These are the revision, so the commit history, which are usually chained together in a long history starting from the oldest commit to the most recent one with uh, branches and merges in there. And you have releases, which are specifically annotated commits declared by the developer as uh, important commits corresponding to software releases, and you have snapshots. So snapshots are the, essentially the pictures we take of a given repository when we find it, noting down where each branch or each tag we're pointing to at a time. Um, in terms of, so this is a conceptual view. In terms of actual technology, this is implemented as a, a very simple uh, object storage here, which we have developed in-house. It's all Python 3. And the reason why we have developed one in-house for now is that we don't want to impose any specific technology to people who might want to mirror our archive. But there is no reason why you couldn't have backends for your favorite uh, distributed object storage. And everything else, so essentially the, the graph structure without the, the final payload of the files, is actually implemented as a Postgres database. There too, it's been working very well for us up to now. There is no reason why it cannot be great in the future to different structures which are well suited to store graphs. But this is pretty big, so we, uh, we are skeptical that many uh, technology for storing smaller graphs would be applicable here. So conceptual view of the archive, what is actually in there today? This is implemented, and it's been in mirroring a lot of source code and source code related artifacts uh, in, in the past months. So in there, in our archive, you will find a full mirror of the public part of GitHub, which is maintained periodically up to date. Uh, you will find all the history of source packages uploaded to Debian between 2005 and 2015, which we have injected one off as a, tri as a dry run, but we will be put in production and the periodic updates uh, in the next few months. Similarly, we have an ingestion of all the tarballs released by the GNU project up to uh, August 2015. Again, one-off uh, uh, um, run, which will be put in production uh, regularly soon. 
And we have locally retrieved a full copy of all the repository for Guitar from Guitarius, thanks to collaboration with the archive team, and a full copy of all the repository that were available on, on Google Code, thanks to collaboration with Google themselves. <coughs> So this is not yet injected in the archive itself. We have local copies, but we are in the process of injecting them. For instance, most of the uh, subversion repositories we retrieve from Google Code have been already ingested in our archive, and we hope to finish that <coughs> soon, in the next few months. Um, in terms of size, all the numbers you see here are unique objects, because we deduplicate everything. So we have 3 billion different unique files, and I mean unique file content with that. We have uh, something like 700 million commits. And all this is coming from a bit more than 50 million software origins. So you can imagine software origin from now as either packages or either version-less packages or uh, um, Git or SVN repository we clone and we retrieve code from. On disk is something like 150 terabytes for the blob store, which of course dominates completely the disk occupation, and a six terabyte database for the graph. If you think of it as a graph, it's a pretty significant structure. It's a graph which has about 5 billion nodes and 50 billion edges among the nodes, so it's a pretty significant graph in itself. Uh, we have reason to believe that this is, it, this is already the richest uh, source code archive in existence, and as you can see from the grow graph, it's growing daily. So what you can do with that? So starting today, as a token of gratitude for all the communities being here at Fostem and all you do for free software, we are opening up our public API. So you can find all the details about our public API at that URL. Uh, I should apologize in advance because it's not yet available via IPv6. We are in discussion with our institutional network provider to uh, give us IPv6 v6 blocks, so this will hopefully be fixed in the next uh, few weeks. Okay, so please bear with us until then and use the uh, FOSDEM ancient network here if you want to access it. Uh, what you can do with that API, you can essentially browse the content of the archive as a point-wise graph structure. So you can jump from one object to another following the links in the graph. So for instance, you can get, jump from releases to the pointed revisions to the pointed directories down to the file content. And you have full access for, uh, for of the entire metadata for any objects you are visiting, okay? Additionally, you have access to all the crawling information. So you can do queries like, when have you last visited these specific Git repositories that I care about? Okay? Or given a specific visit you have done on a Git repository, where were each, all those branches that I have pointing to at a time? So it's a sort of wayback machine for your Git and, uh, repositories and your source code releases. Um, you have a full endpoint index available and linked from the main API documentation. But just to give you an overview, this is a full story you can follow with, uh, with our API. Let's assume you are a developer of Highlang, which is a Lisp uh, dialect implemented in Python. Uh, you can ask, what is the ID origin identifier for that repository, given the canonical URL of the repository we clone from? So you have this endpoint here, origin. You give it the type of origin. You give it the URL of the clone URL, and we'll, we'll answer you with the ID of the origin. So this is origin ID number one. Equipped with the uh, origin number, you can jump to the list of visits, and we'll return you a list of all the visits we have done. Uh, specifically, visit number 13 has been done at this timestamp, which is a few months ago. I believe it's something like September 2016. And it will give you the URL where you find more details about that specific visit. So you jump to that. And you will find a huge mapping of all the branches and tags, or refs in Git terminology, and where they were pointing to at the time. So for instance, master branch, we're pointing to the uh, target commit uh, B94, et cetera, which is actually a, a revision, okay, a commit. And it will give you the URL to know more about that object. A different tag, the release 0, 010, 0, was pointing to a release object, which and it gives you the URL of that release object. So you drill down, for instance, I follow this release, and you f I found out the committee was pointing to, and you will arrive at this uh, vision number, which will tell you all the information about that specific commit. So that commit was done by our friend Paul, which is one of the maintainers of Highlang. Uh, we'll tell you information about the date of the commit, the date of the, uh, the committer date, it might be different in general, and we'll point you to the directory, so to the root directory associated to that commit. And you can continue. You can give you, of course, you can, it will give you also the, the commit message for that specific uh, revision. 
And you can follow the directory structure down to specific content objects. Okay? When you arrive at a content object, you have the information about all the checksum we compute for the contents, uh, which is the SHA-1, the SHA-1 git, and the SHA-256. Okay? And we'll give you additional information, which is still work in project, progress, like detected information like the file type, the language type, and the license type, the license we have detected for the file. Uh, and it will give you also a link to the content of the file itself for download. So a couple of caveats apply here, in addition to not having IPv6. So we have a rate limits that apply throughout the API that are pretty, they are pretty severe. For now, you can do 120 requests per hour. And blob download, so the actual access to the file itself, is not available yet. This is because we are focusing our resources on developing and adding new features to the archive, rather than in uh, putting energy in keeping up our, our infrastructure to offer this as a public service for everyone. But we are open to help in case you have resources to offer to actually lift those restrictions in the future. So zooming out a little bit, this is a specific thing we are releasing today, which is navigation of the archive to an API. We had already released in the past a very simple feature accessible from our main website, which will allow you to just drag and drop tarballs or a set of files to see which of those files we have already archived. And in the future, we will be working on a proper web UI okay, for the equivalent of the API for, web, for browser users. We'll, we will work, of course, in allowing you to download code from as tarballs or as uh, Git bundles, for instance. And this is, will be hopefully available in the next few months. And adding provenance information, telling you where we have seen all the places where we have found a specific object or a specific comment. And full text search, of course, because it's really interesting to, once you have this archive, it's super interesting to be able to do full text search of, on, of all of it. And much more. So once you have this archive, really the, the sky is the limit of what you can imagine. And you can help. Okay, so most of the people here are free software enthusiasts and are coders. So this is run as a, free, as a standard free software project. We have our own forge, we have developer information, we have a mailing list, we have an IRC channel, and all our code is available as free software on our forge, which is a fabricator instance which we, uh, which we love. In case you're interested in contributing, so these are some of our top development priorities. So of course we need to add more listers for forges out there that we don't track yet. And each type of different forge will need a specific lister. We need loaders for VCS and package format that we don't support yet. We need the web UI itself, uh, which we, uh, we, are, we have a prototype, but it's not uh, ready to be released as a product yet. And of course, there is the ample opportunity of working on indexing content that it is in the archive with whatever indexer you can imagine. So, but of course, all, coding, all contribution are welcome. So just follow our development channels, show up on our forge, talk, to, talk with us, and we'll, uh, find, we'll, there, there's definitely something you can do that match your interest and that will help us in our mission. And of course, you can also join us. So we have opportunities for students, both on development topics and on the research topics. And we have actually an open position right now for people who want to work on the, our web API, or our web UI, sorry. And they are available at the, this, this address that you see on the slide. Um, Roberto. So, thanks a lot, Stefano, for this in-depth presentation of what we are doing. Back to the old guy that brings again the institutional point of view here. Okay? So you see there is interest in technology going on here, and it's an extremely exciting technical project to do this. It's really not easy. Right? It's a lot of work. Uh, and here you see a picture of four people. So me, Roberto, Stefano there, Nicola, Antoine. Okay. So these four guys have been working like crazy for the last two years, I would say, huh, more or less. Uh, to try to bring together this first initial part of the project. Clearly, we do not pretend to do this alone. We will never succeed doing this alone. So what is very important for us is to make sure there is a community around it. So the first step in building this community was to get support from a national instit research institution, which is INRIA in France. I don't know how many of you know it, but it's a fantastic place which is a, a research center fully dedicated to uh, uh, computer science that has already shown in the past that they have a strong culture in free and open source software. There are a lot of contribution coming from there. And also, they are willing to do something which is special, that is to say, help creating new institutions. They were one of the founding partners of the W3C 
over 20 years ago, and they are ready to do this again. They have put already on the table a lot, a lot of resources and energy. We are in their office space, we are using their infrastructure, we are using their services for a lot of things. And uh, uh, so this gives us security for the next few years. But again, it's not enough. We need to bring a lot of people, more people around. And so we have been talking, uh -uh. we have been talking to partners all around the world, telling them what we are doing, getting mind share, getting support. So all the people in this list are actually supporting the project. I, I'm sure you will recognize some name. And the red ones here in the first lines are actually people who make a step more by actually providing real resources. These resources can be money, we need it to hire people to offer you a job, for example. Uh, it can be infrastructures, it can be connection with the uh, research networks, etc. So you discover some usual suspects in the, in the IT industry, but you have also people from uh, research organizations and from other places in society like banks, for example. Please, please, if you have connection with these people and these people can come and help, it's very important to have them around the table, as we have said. So to conclude, uh, we do hope we managed to convince you that Sota Railage here is a very exciting new project that has a clear mission, which is not just uh, another project, but something which is really at the service of our community and through this also at the service of society at the world. We are very open to collaboration, it's core of our uh, values, and we try to do everything possible to make it easy to other pe for other people to come. So you have connection ports to the project that can be institutional if you want to just give money or, or, or resources, that can are more traditionally in community if you want to collaborate with us, or come in internship, if you want to provide time, brain, knowledge, Everything is really open to collaboration. You know it's not easy, uh, creating a community around the project takes time, but as I always say, it's not just a destination, it's a journey, okay, which is important. And so I believe we should see more people coming and try to work together on this project, which is not just our project, it is our project as a community. So I think I will stop here, and we all thank you very much for your attention. I have a bunch of questions. The first one is about software that was written in DED that wasn't open source, um, where the company that wrote the software died. Like I'm thinking about something like VisiCalc. They they wrote something that was the first uh, spreadsheet. You don't have the source code. You don't have the source code. Are you guys open up, uh, on doing stuff that the archive.org people are doing, which is reverse engineering these things to get the source code and archive it, or? You, you have issues with the legal part of it and are thinking that these pieces of software are dead and long gone. That's my first question. And my second question is, um, you have 150 terabytes of data. How do you maintain that on the long term? Knowing that for NASA, for instance, their, their image system, they have um, cartridges and it takes them seven years to copy the complete archive to a new system. And when they're done copying, the new system is obsolete already. What's your plan for that? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Two, two very interesting questions. One thing is, uh, is the archive open only to free and open source software or also to other uh, source code? And what about software for which we do not have source code? Again, Unix philosophy, we focus exactly and only on collecting, storing, and preserving the source code. So it's not our business to do reverse engineering or something which comes outside. But if you do the reverse engineering and you have the legal rights of depositing it, that's okay. Okay, we get that. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah, but, but they mostly. So he said that there is a part of archive.org doing reverse engineering and posting the result of the reverse engineering. Yeah, okay. So repeating the question because you didn't have a mic. So. Okay, okay. So in, again, but in, in, uh, the point is to. to provide an infrastructure that can store all this, is, this kind of source code, and all initiatives that can provide new contents are welcome. But we are bound, again, by legal issues, as you said, 
so we can only accept software that we can copy. So for example, of course you will find in the archive software which is not free software, that our basic requirements is that we can copy it and then somebody can do something useful. The, least, the minimal useful thing you can do with software, as you see very well in Truscode, read it. Okay, even just reading it, that's enough for us. That, that will come in. That was question number one. The question number two is uh, long-term reliability of all this. Again, as I said, the destination is important, but we are in the middle of a journey. We are not there yet. So for now, the size of the archive is not so impressive after all. I mean, it's very costly if you want to maintain it yourself. But if you look at all the movies or cats which are uploaded by my kids uh, every year, <laughs> Now and then it's not it's YouTube size. It's, it's, it's big, but it's, it's not YouTube it's not size. Huge. And so there is this issue of really, really long-term preservation. I do believe much more in a network of mirrors and this, these mirrors using different technologies. But one thing we are doing, we are talking to libraries, for example. And these libraries have a mission to archive digital content, specifically digitization, etc. And they have a very structured process to actually make copy to tapes and make sure these tapes are changed when the technology changes, etc. Again, not our main mission right here, but again, collaboration with other entities, they try to do this. And we are starting making these connections. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, Can you raise your hand? Yes, I'm standing up here. Ah, okay, so, thanks. Hey. Uh, it's a twofold question. It's uh, related to the right to be forgotten and also to problems that you can create when people don't want their codes to be public anymore. So like happened to Gmain a few months ago, some crazy communities somewhere in Asia, India, I don't know, decided that they weren't happy with the site and they attacked the site, put it down. So do you have any thought about the idea of people not wanting it to be free anymore or if it offends someone or a community, the fact that it's free? I don't know, something in the sense of a way out of your of your solution. Right, so of course we will abide to the law or regulation that apply where the software is hosted, which right now is hosted in France, and in Europe I believe we have the most strict regulation on the right to be forgotten and whatnot. So what we will do is that we already have a legal page information on our, on our website, and if there is any applicable law, either for what you mentioned or for you know, copyright infringement, we will just hide the content. So the content will no longer be available for download. We will keep a copy of it if the laws allows us to do so. So for instance, if the rights expire one day, we will be able to distribute it again. Which doesn't apply to your case, of course, but might apply to other uh, law regulations. Um, so I, had a, I made a couple of notes that, about your data model. Um, they're like details, but you're going to have to change the data model occasionally. You're obviously going to want to change to a different hash function. Um, What's your, do you have like a transition plan for how to, how to upgrade from right. old to new with more data in the commit objects or whatever? Right, so we are already resistant to SHA-1 collision because I didn't show the details, but for blobs we are computing three kind of ashes and we have unique indexes on each of them, so we will spot if there is a SHA-1 collision, but of course it will evolve and the idea is that we will have versioning on the scheme we use for our identifiers. So for now, SHA-1 is doing well. There are no well-known SHA-1 collision in the wild, but they will arrive at some point. And the idea that we will have new releases of our identifier scheme and you know, switch to a bigger F hash function or a better hash function. So for the fun technological fact, the only reason we don't have SHA-3 yet is that when we started, there wasn't yet a uh, pretty decent SHA-3 implementation in the Python standard library, but uh, in the version you know, of our stable releases we're using, but we're uh, ready to actually add that into the mix as well, and maybe just you know, adopt that as main identifier for the time being. We are waiting for the first SHA-1 collision to, to publish a paper as soon as possible I mean, in the security conference. We found it. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, first one is, um, if I am a user of, of, of this archive, how do I find a better source code in there? Will there be some ranking system or some, some distinction that I can, that, that, that I can uh, take, as, uh, take as a sign to find a better source code, which I'm actually interested in? And the second question is, uh, how do you, do, do you make money, would, would you make money to support the, all this infrastructure and your work? Will it be donations like Wiki, Wiki, Wikipedia or some, something else? 
Thank you. Okay, very, very interesting. Two questions. So the first one is how, the, the first, your first question is a potential very interesting use case. Now that you have this fantastic place where all the source code is available in a uniform way, let me stress it again, and the value added here is that you have a uniform view of the source code no matter where it has been developed, etc. Now that you have this, how can I ask a smart question like, for example, I'm writing HTTP server number 32, because I prefer to write another one, where could I find a piece of code which is relevant to what I'm doing? Okay. That's a potential application that can be built on top of the archive. It is not our mission to do this application, but it is our mission to make sure you have everything necessary to build it. Okay. And there are people doing work in this. I mean, if you are interested in this, I can give you pointers to research or work in that particular direction there. The challenge here is to scale. I mean, the scale is much bigger than what you see in this kind of thing. Our time's up. And final question, uh, very quickly. Yeah, here. Um, uh, I have, I have uh, one question. I should answer the, the, the last question here. Oh, yeah, okay. There was a second part, very quickly. Yeah. So how we find the money, you are right. We need to eat at the end of the month, have everybody. But you see our strategy is replication, if you remember. So we are building something which I, I believe is valuable to many, 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 many different parties. So the idea is to have a common infrastructure where many different stakeholders put energy to make it stay. It is not just for industry, not just for science, not just for education, not just for cultivation, for everything. So we are trying to talk to everybody, and that should make it sufficient to make it work. So time's up, I understand, or do you want? Oh, okay, okay, last question, go ahead. Yeah, my last question would be, um, you make own, um, own comments where you find it, where, where you, um, when you find it, this archive you pull, um, do you give other options for historical reasons, something, some comments ability maybe in future? So for historical um, listing, because you, what you do is a, uh, is a historical view on, on source code. So it would be, maybe it would be an idea to, to also give an additional historical comment of some sort. Yeah? That, Is that, in your plans? That, that's definitely a thing we want to see. I mean, it's in this semantic Wikipedia software that, that Stefano mentioned, the point is to make sure we connect with other initiatives like Wikidata, Wikidata, Wikimedia, other people who are doing serious studies on this. The Computer History Museum, uh, the Internet Archive or something like this, to, to make sure that you find extra information on the source code and you connect it to what we are doing. But again, mm -hmm. our main goal is just focus on the source code and make sure we connect with the other initiative. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, just connect with other people. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Th thanks a lot for your interest. Thanks for your attention. Right. Thank you, Roberto and Stefano. Thanks. We have a little gift for you, so thank you. <laughs> Enjoy, and thanks for your talk. A lot of questions before there were no questions. Yeah, it's all. I missed that point last year. So what do you think? It's super exciting to me. It sounds great. It sounds great. I have a um, couple of tiny little quibbles, I think, with your data model. So two of them are about timestamps. Uh, you, I infer, are currently recording the timestamps that you get out of, say, a tarball or a WS or something. We are. You are recording. We are. Jolly good. Uh, we because are. Because it turns out that those are important. Yeah. So we have actually a good kind of timestamp. One is our own timestamps, which is like a wall clock when you do the video. Right. And people will have to trust us that we said, we have seen that, that there is, we are the source of authority. Right. The other one are all the timestamps that are in the object themselves. For instance, Debian package. When we inject Debian source package, we extract the timestamp of the change log for the last right. entry, and we store them as additional metadata. What about the timestamps of the individual files? Uh, we, uh, we don't store that at the time. We store the you need to store that. Yeah, I agree. So they, they, they actually, what is difficult is to find the right balance between all the data you store and what matters to compute the node idea. Right. So what is actually subject to the hash function you use to compute. Right. And that's really a pretty hard that's, balance that's, to that's, find. That's awkward because ideally you would like 
the node ID of a bubble and of the corresponding Git thing to be the same. The problem is that Git doesn't store.